Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. A Matter of Doubt, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're in a tight squeeze and crying uncle won't get you out, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, recently my young son Stephen has been hurt twice and what he insists were just accidents. It's true they were the kind of things that might have happened to any active youngster, but I refuse to accept that explanation. And I believe all this goes back to the time Stephen told a fantastic story to the police about an altogether different matter. It's It's this this very story story that that keeps them from believing what I suspect now, that something terrible is happening to my son. I'm sure if you'll let me talk to you, you'll realize I'm not just imagining things. And it's signed, Eleanor Rollins. Uh Uh-huh. Regis Park. That new development for XGI is out in the new lots section. That's right, George. I wonder why Mrs. Rollins wasn't more specific about... About the clash Stephen had with the police? Yeah. Frankly, Angel, I think this whole thing is nothing more than the overstimulated fear that every mother has for her young ones. Oh, maybe you're right. Why don't you do the easiest and obvious thing? Huh? Call Lieutenant Riley and find out what trouble Stephen's had with the police. Go ahead. <laughs> and that's the last thing in the world you want me to do, isn't it, Brooksy? Oh, I didn't say anything. No, but the way you didn't say it... I simply well, since meant... since we've gone this far, let me go on reading your mind. You being a woman can tell the mother isn't just clucking like a hen. After all, I am a potential mother myself. And if I do decide to look into this hazy hassle, I should get all the dope firsthand from Mrs. Rollins herself. I don't want you to feel I'm talking you into this, George. Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. Come on, grab that undernourished garden you call a hat, and let's get going, potential mother. Mr. Valentine, that's the story exactly the way Stephen told it to the police. Isn't it, Stephen? I haven't anything else to say, Mom. What am I going to do with him, Mr. Valentine? Make him explain why he told a story like that. Well, you're certainly not going to do it by raising your voice, Mrs. Rollins. That's right. And come on, sit down. Yes, I... I guess I'd better... The fact remains, Stephen said he was on his way home from school. Cutting across the fields, he saw a man who'd been shot... He told me he made a bandage to stop the bleeding. Then ran a couple of blocks to a service station to call the police. Mm -hmm. And when they came, he reversed himself and told them he made it all up. I know my boy better than that. He doesn't lie. He doesn't make things up. Not to me. Mother and the son couldn't be closer than we are. This is just the two of us. Stephen's not just another boy. He thinks like a man. Maybe you've had me pegged wrong, Mom. Like the cops I read too many comic books, I, I just want a little excitement. Uh, but, Steve, when the squad car came, you were caught running away. You put yourself right on the spot by saying you made it all up. Now, why? You look like you're a smarter boy than that. That's how it is. You just can't get anything out of him. Yeah. Well, all right, kids, you've got us all on the run. Now, I'm not asking you to tell us in so many words what's behind this, but you can at least shake your head yes or no. You can do that for a fella, can't you? Well, did something happen to you that day that made you so scared you can't talk? Didn't those accidents you told your mother about have something to do with what happened to you that day? You lied when you said Chuck Foster beat you up. I tried to horn in on my paper, Rob. But your mother checked. And Chuck said he had nothing to do with it. And just another boy couldn't have worked you over like that, Steve. And you didn't break your wrist slipping down into that ravine. Why, you've been coming home that way for the last two years. You couldn't be that careless. That's the way it happened. It's no use. It's no use. Um, Look, ladies, would you mind leaving me alone with Steve? Just for a few minutes, uh, Claire. Oh, yes, George. Mrs. Rollins, I think you and I can do with a good cup of coffee. Let's go in the kitchen. You fellas join us when you're ready, huh? Well, Steve, that was pretty quick thinking, being able to fix up a man's wound when you found him bleeding like that. I keep telling you that it never happened. Well, but if it did happen, you you could have done a good job. After all, you're a Boy Scout, and you won your first aid badge. Your mother told me all about it, how proud you were of it. That doesn't prove anything. Oh, maybe not. 
Say, how about this newspaper route you got? Business good? Good enough. <laughs> good enough to bring a little something into the house each week to help your mother? Well, I don't know what you're driving at. Well, I'm driving at this, Steve. You're not the kind of kid who lies and gets himself into a mess like this with the cops. That I'm sold on. Look. Look, now that we got rid of the gals, we can talk sort of man to man. Steve, tell me. Just what's going on in your mind? Come on, now open up. What are you thinking about? You did the best you could, Sonny. You can't... can't patch me up. Just remember... San Diego... Mercantile Trust... Red Kenzie... He... He got me. Remember... Didn't you hear me, Steve? Uh, what? Why were you running away when the cops picked you up? Why were you putting on an act? Didn't think I'd still be alive when you come back, eh, kid? You did a better job than you thought. Now listen. Forget everything I said before. If you say a word to anybody, I'll get your mother. Get your mother. Remember. Come on, shake out of it, Steve. Don't stir at me like that when I'm talking to you. I'm not telling you anything. Get that straight. Look, don't you see? You've got to get it off your chest, son. Your mother believes in you. You've got to do it for her sake if you're in any kind of trouble. Yeah, for, for her sake. This man you helped, did he give you that beating you blamed on Chuck? Why did he do it? There was no man. Okay, okay. How about accident number two? Who gave you the assist that sent you to the bottom of that ravine so that you needed a doctor to take care of you? Now think about that a minute before you answer. Come on, pick yourself up, kid. You're going to get worse than this if you don't talk. I'm the guy who messed up the job killing that rat you found. Me, Red Kenzie. Why'd you lie to the cops? Where's he hiding out? Better come clean. Now you got both of us on your tail. Okay, Steve, okay. I see you'd rather die than say anything. And maybe you think you got your own good reason. Yeah. Get your mother. Get your mother. Well, Steve... You're going to find out that I can be a pretty stubborn character, too. Valentine, you can't say I'm not cooperative. You asked for information on the capers of that kid, Steve Rollins, and I got it for you. Here. Thanks, Lieutenant Raleigh. Hmm. Well, not much I didn't know before. Nothing we didn't know before. Just that he called and faked a story about finding a man shot in the neck on New Lots Road. My good, good friends, I'm sorry I can't enlarge on the kid's antics just to please you. He got off light as it was, playing games like that with the police. Okay, Riley, okay, take it easy, will you? This wasn't meant to be an invitation to apoplexy. Yeah. How about those accidents? You just answered your own question, Miss Brooks. They were just accidents. Accidents and a jittery mother who's imagining a lot of boogeymen out to harm her little chick. Lieutenant, did it ever occur to you that mothers have a certain instinct about such things? And did it ever occur to you that I ought to know something about mothers, having had one myself? From the way you act, you'd think Mrs. Rollins was just put on earth to keep your colleagues from enjoying their pinochle in their various precinct stations. Is that so? Well, let me whoa, tell you whoa, that whoa, I... Whoa, whoa, now, let's break this up. Huh. Oh, yeah? Huh. Say, what's going on here anyway, Valentine? Why has your girlfriend suddenly decided to swarm all over oh, look, me? Look, Riley, you touched a sore point with Brooksy, implying even the slightest fault in a mother. Who? Who, me? Well, there are only the three of us here, and I've learned by experience to keep my mouth shut on the subject. Why, I'm the staunchest defender motherhood ever had. Why, when I hear Mammy sung on the radio, I'm no good for days. Your sarcasm has all the grace of an elephant with a sprained ankle. Hey, look, kids, time out. Lest we forget one Stephen Rollins. Yeah, I wish I was allowed to forget him. Riley, I know a scared kid when I see one. I'm convinced there was a man that day, and Steve was handed a load of dynamite. He's too young to know how to handle. Well, if that's what you think, there's nothing I can do about Granted. it. Granted. But if I can find something that seems to confirm what I believe, will you hop on the wagon with me? Well, you know better than that. Of course I will. Good. 
Okay, come on, Brooksy. We got to get back to Regis Park. Surely now the police will believe you, Mr. Valentine. The car deliberately tried to run Stephen down. When did this happen, Mrs. Rogers? Just about an hour ago when he was coming home from school. Would you recognize the car if you saw it again, Stephen? No, Miss Brooks. I wasn't looking where I was going. It was just an accident. Mom's just imagining things. Mr. Crawford, the druggist, happened to be looking out of his window. He says the automobile kept coming right at you. You had all you could do to get out of the way. It's nothing to worry about. I only got a scrape knee out of it. These accidents keep happening to you, Steve, and even faster now. Still, you're holding back. I'm just telling you what happened, Mr. Valentine. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. Come on, don't. Hey, Steve, look. The reason I dropped by was to see if you'd take a walk with me over to New Lots Road, where the whole thing started. Do you think you're up to it? You don't need me. The police told you where they found me. Um, please. Be honest, Mr. Valentine. Do as he says. He's trying to help You were us. running away when the squad car picked you up. Now, I want to know the exact spot where you found that man. What man? Well, Steve, I guess you win this round, too. We'll just have to see how far we can get without you. See if the man was so seriously wounded, it stands to reason there had to be some sign of violence on the scene. Lucky we didn't have any rain the last couple of weeks. Yeah, but George, mm. we're a good block away from New Lots Road and Downey Boulevard where they picked up Steve. I know, Angel, I know. The man probably was lying in all this tall grass and couldn't be seen from the road. But Steve would be cutting across these fields on his way home from school. Yeah, I see what you mean. Just a kid on his way home from school. Like any other day, minding his own business and walking into something like this, whatever it is. Huh? Just like we've walked into something. Yeah. Hey, that looks like a part of a man's shirt. The collar of a man's shirt, blood on it. Of course, he was shot in the neck. Stephen must have torn the collar off so he could get to the wound. Well, this didn't come from any dollar ninety-eight job either. It's part of a silk twenty-dollar creation. Our Mister X is somebody in the chips. Oh, too bad we don't have the rest of the shirt. One like that usually sports a monogram over the left-hand pocket. Well, anyway, it sports a label. Jonathan's. That's the shop where they look down their noses if your bill runs under $200. No question about how fast we have to work now. No, Brooksy. Every minute we don't find the answer to all this is another minute Steve's life is worth under two cents. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. In an average day's driving, how many times do you think you cut the ignition, park for a while, and then start out again? If you say ten times, then let me tell you how to be sure of ten fast starts. Just switch to that great Chevron Supreme gasoline. It's specially blended to give faster starts and faster warm-ups. So you're off to a good start every time you press the starter. Chevron Supreme gives your car new alertness in traffic, too. Gives ping-free power that lifts you over the hills. In fact, for today's high-compression engines, you can't buy a better gasoline. Another thing, premium-quality Chevron Supreme is climate-tailored. Tailored to the season and to the West's different temperature and altitude zones. So wherever you drive, go on Chevron Supreme, and you'll agree it gets the best out of your car. Ask for it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Young Steve Rollins saves a man's life and hears a few disjointed words gasped out in pain, something about a San Diego bank robbery and a name, Red Kenzie. But if he reveals any of this, he knows what will happen. You tell anything you heard, kid, and I'll get your mother. Get your mother. Remember? 
But then the aforesaid Red Kenzie also puts his sentence of death over the boy if he doesn't repeat every word he heard. This is the squeeze you don't know a thing about as you try to find the reason for the series of strange accidents that have been happening to the youngster. In fact, all you do have is a single clue, the blood-stained collar of a man's shirt. And like George Valentine, you try to make the most of it. Hotchkiss? Uh, yes, uh, yes, indeed. I happen to be interested in shirts. Well, you certainly come to the right person. I wouldn't be the head of this department here at Jonathan's if I didn't know the importance of this shirt to the man. Oh, Mr. Valentine agrees with you so completely. He wouldn't think of going out in the morning without putting one on. I exactly, but I... Uh, uh, oh, I see. <clears throat> the fact is, I'm very anxious to locate a friend who bought a shirt here some time ago. Maybe you can help me. Always glad to cooperate. That's our motto here at Jonathan's, you know. Caveat emptor. <laughs> That's Latin. The customer is always right. I do hope that when your friend mentioned our shirts, he had nothing but praise for them. Mm, yes, except for one small item. What did you say? A flaw in one of our shirts? A Jonathan shirt? Well, uh, Mr. Hotchkiss, it seems they pick up stains so easily, especially around the collar. Hey, I'll take a look. But, oh. oh, please don't faint, Mr. Hotchkiss. It's only blood. <laughs> Hold on to the counter, friend. Just think of it as red ink, and you'll pull through this like a hero right out of Rudyard Kip. Yes, you're, you're, you're so right, sir. I, I'll try to be strong. Now, uh, just how can I help you? Okay, any chance of you remembering the man you sold this shirt to? Uh, just from this, uh, this collar? Well, I know it'd be a small miracle if you had an answer, but still, that's what I gotta know. A boy's life depends on it. I'm sorry, but we sell dozens of shirts with a collar like this every week. Well, look at it carefully. Something may occur to you. Something to make you remember who bought it. Uh, uh, no, no, miss. I'm afraid there's nothing I can tell you. Okay. Well, Brooksy, that's a gold star forever in any way. Thanks just the same, Mr. Hotchkiss. Right you are. Oh, oh uh, one moment. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan's never puts this size of the shirt on the collar. Two plebeian, you know. But I can tell at a glance, this is the smallest size we sell, size 14 next. Well, what about it? Well, the man who wears this size would have to be of a very small stature indeed. Yeah, yeah, but can you remember such a man? Uh, of course, there were several 14s in the last month or two, but, but one man does seem to stand out from the other. Yeah. Oh, give, Mr. Hotchkiss, give. Is there a sales check on record, his, his name or address? Uh, no, no, young lady. He merely pointed to the shirts he wanted and paid for them in, in cash. I thought it was a bit odd. Well, could you recognize him if you saw him again? He was a small, dark-eyed, uh, ferrety gentleman. Not at all like our usual clientele here at Jonathan's. Breeding, you know. Still, I doubt if I could be sure about the identification. Does that help at all? Buster, we're fighting against time. Anything might help. That's most gratifying indeed. Brooksy, remind me to send this gentleman a shirt for Christmas. Hey, Angel, go over to the window and let us know when Steve turns into the block. Okay. Lieutenant Riley, are you sure nothing can happen to my boy while he's out to the store? Not unless I have a very dumb flat foot shadowing him, and I haven't, Mrs. Rollins. When Valentine told me about finding that collar, I made up my mind. If it's the last thing I do, nothing else is going to happen to Steve. Besides, we had to get him out of the house to the bakery for a while so we could set up this plan of mine. Yes. Now, uh, now are you sure you still want Valentine to go through with it? Do you think there can be any question? For weeks I've been frantic about whether Steve would come home alive. This has got to stop now. He can't go around with a bodyguard the rest of his life. No matter what Mr. Valentine has to do to trick Stephen into telling us who's threatening him, it has to be done. Well, I realize it's a drastic step we're taking, Lieutenant, but, well, I'd like to avoid it, but... Do you think there's any chance of us going through the files and finding someone like this small, dark-eyed, ferrety individual? No. No, not a chance. Any harness bull can name me a dozen bookies and pool room sharks that would fit that description. Yeah, I guess so. Well, nothing to do but wait now. No sign of him yet. The squad car's here. All right, now look. As soon as the boy gets in sight, the empty ambulance will streak back to town, and I'll go out and hop in the squad car with the boys. Oh, it's so hard to understand, Mr. Valentine. 
Why, my own son wouldn't confide in me no matter what trouble he was in. Look, I tried to tell you, Mrs. Rollins. If Steve refused to talk, it was not because he was afraid for himself, but for the only other person in the world who he cares a thing about. You, his mother. Oh, Steve. And that's the way I figured it. That's the way I'm playing it now, with Lieutenant Riley making it possible. George, come here, quick. Yeah, what is it, Brooksy, Steve? No. That car just going around the corner. Well... I thought it was funny the way it was parked there and the man at the wheel staring at this house. What about Miss Brooks? Well, he didn't stick around a second after the squad car showed the up. The driver. Anything like the description Hotchkiss gave us? No, just the opposite, George. Almost took up the whole front seat. Oh, great, great. That's all we need. Another interested party pops into the picture. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Hmm? Here comes Stephen now. Okay, Riley, give the ambulance a nod. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Make sure Mrs. Rollins stays away from the window. Yeah, don't worry about that. Now, I'll beat it out the side door and the rest is up to you, Valentine. Yeah. And that makes me feel just swell. Oh, Steve. Just a minute. I I want to talk to you. What is it, Mr. Valentine? What happened? What's the matter? Now look, don't fly off the handle, kid. Why are you talking to me this way? Tell me. Well, you're not giving me a chance. I'm not blind. I just saw that ambulance drive I away. I know, Steve. I, I know. And the police car in front of our house. What's it doing there? Well, I was coming to that. You don't have to bother. Something happened to my mother, and they just took her away. That's it, isn't it? If you'll just hold it a minute, son. I did everything that man told me to. Kept my mouth shut. But that wasn't enough for him. He hurt my mother anyway. Is my mother... No, she'll be all right. But who is this person you're talking about, Steve? Now, you got to tell me. We have to work fast. No, I'm not going to tell you anything. I've got some place to go. Look, Steve, you've got to tell me. I'm tired of being a good boy with marbles. Now I'm going to be a bad boy with a knife. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here, you're crazy. You're not going to stop me. Nobody is. What is it, George? What happened? Oh, the kid threw me a curve a mile wide. Instead of telling me the name of the guy with a punctured neck, he's on his way to take care of things himself. We've got to stop him. Come on, hurry, Brooksy. Get in the car. You take the wheel. Yeah, but... Take it slow and make sure you keep Steve in sight. Obviously, he knows where our man lives. Okay. Hey, Valentine, what's up? Uh, No time to explain, Riley. Just follow us. must be the street, George. Steve's slowing up. Yeah. Hibiscus Drive. Fine name for a street line with nothing but run-down rooming houses. And one looks the same as another. Uh-huh. Number 21. 23. Okay. George! Just want to be ready, Angel. The moment he picks out the house, i got to be right on top of him so I can take it from there. Number 31. Slower, Brooks, and slower. I wouldn't be surprised if this is where Steve got the beating. That's why he knows where he's going. George, look, this is it. Yeah. That's all for you, Steve. What? I, I told now you... go over there and stay with Miss Brooks. Oh! Down, 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 stupid Steve. Let go of me, Mr. Stay Bell, where you are. Stay where you are. Now, what's the guy's name so I can go in there and get him? I don't know. I just call him the Weezer because the way he talks... I... Hey, that man running in the house. Yes, Steve? That's the other man, Red Kenzie... He tried to make me tell about the Weezer. Okay, let him get in the house. This looks like more fireworks. It is Riley now. George, that man who just went in, he was the one in the car in front of Mrs. Rollins. Look, house. Brooks, you should have stayed where you were. The guy inside wants to shoot it out. Oh. Mr. George Valentine. Yeah, Roland. Yeah, Riley. Uh, Sergeant, keep the people out the street and take care of these two. Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, Riley, let's go. Will you make it snappy, lady? What room's this guy better down in? Now, how, how can I tell you, mister, if you don't even know the name of the tenant you're looking for? Uh, what's the answer to that one? Well, he's got to be a small, skinny runt, dark eyes. Probably looks like the really rat he is. Oh, yeah, I know who you mean. The man in room six. Hey, Riley, somebody got his. Oh, one less to worry about. You can drop that arsenal now, brother. Can I argue about it, Kenzie? No. No, no hero stuff for me against a raft of cops. That's smart. Even if it isn't going to change your destination. Well, this guy here is cold turkey. <laughs> That's the way I should have been a couple of weeks ago when I plugged him. and left him in that field out there in Regis Park. What kind of game were you kids playing anyway? What were you trying to get out of him? About 200,000 bucks we got from a San Diego bank. They supposed to meet me later. But he double-crossed me. He's got all of it stashed somewhere. 
Sure, sure, the San Diego job. We've had you on the pickup list for that deal. And that must be Mitchell. I would have let that punk live. He'd have told me where he hid the dough. He just stood there flapping his mouth with no words coming out. You know, Kenzie, you're going to get the business because of a dirty trick you played on yourself. <laughs> what are you bleating about? It's just this. Your friend here was trying to tell you, but he couldn't make with the words. You forget. You shot him through the neck. Yes, Mr. Valentine. It was Kenzie who pushed me down to Selwyn's Gulch. And I recognized the wheeze when he tried to run me down today. <laughs> they really had you between and betwixt, didn't they, Steve? Yeah, and I don't know what I'd have done if it weren't for you and Miss Brooks. But I just couldn't let anything happen to Mom. Well, looking back on it now, Steve, don't you think you should have confided in your mother? She would have found an answer. That's what mothers are for. Corny as it sometimes sounds, mothers do know best. Sure. Uh, but... I, uh, I think I'd better warn you, Buster. You're going to be on the losing end of this argument. You're tangling with an authority on that particular subject. Huh? Don't listen to him, Steve. Mr. Valentine is just yeah. trying to be funny. Oh. Yeah, don't you listen to her. She's just trying to blacken my character. Oh. Steve, all you ever need to know about mothers, you'll learn from that lady up there on the porch. Go on, scram, kid. Don't keep your mom waiting. Ask a woman driver what she knows about motor oil for her car, and chances are she'll say, not very much, really. But when she uses RPM motor oil, don't be surprised to hear her say, I do know that RPM helps the family budget. And that's because the complete protection your car gets with RPM means a cleaner engine, fewer repair bills. Special compounds in RPM prevent the formation of gummy carbon and lacquer deposits. They fight off rust and corrosion by making the oil adhere to every inch of internal metal. That means protection for upper cylinder walls, the hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils. Even when you've parked your car, the adhering agent in RPM keeps a rust-proofing film of oil on vertical engine parts, usually drained bare. The economy of RPM is another reason why it's first choice in the West. Better get RPM tomorrow. Get it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Next week, when we catch up with George Valentine as he is doing a little investigating at a mother load town, we'll hear him saying... Hey, now, look, Sheriff, isn't there something you can tell us about this case? Hey, come on, Sheriff. George, I think he's going to... I've got him, Brooksy. Mr. Stevens, anybody, get a doctor, quick! It won't do much good, Brooksy. What? The Sheriff seems to have had too much to drink. Too much poison. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Molly Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Rollins, Jeffrey Silver as Stephen... Herbert Lytton is Kinsey, and Bob Griffin is Hotchkiss. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System.